Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session about event-driven and serverless applications using Spring Cloud and Spring Native. I'm Thomas Vitale. I work as a senior software engineer at Systematic in Denmark. I really like building applications with Java and in particular with Spring and really passionate about anything cloud native. I'm also writing a book on those topics. It's called Cloud Native Spring in Action with Spring Boot and Kubernetes, published by many. Today, I'm going to talk about serverless. This term literally means without servers, but we know that's not true. We, as developers, take care of uh, providing the application executables, possibly as a container, and then the platform takes care of everything. So we don't deal with the uh, nodes, with the orchestration, with scheduling, with scaling. The platform takes care of everything, in particular of dynamically scaling the application, depending on the workload. And if there is no work to do, so if there's no request, no event to process, then it scales the application to zero, which is one of the main features of a serverless architecture. By doing this, we can really optimize cost because it means that we only pay for what we use when we use it. And if there is no work to do, then we pay nothing because our applications will not be up. This model, of course, has some uh, uh, consequences because if we say that the moment a request arrives or an event happens, we spin up a new application instance. That means the application has to start processing the request or the event immediately. We cannot wait a few seconds. So more standard Java applications are not really suitable for this model because they would take a few seconds before being ready to process new requests. In the Spring ecosystem, we can use the exciting new project called Spring Native. The goal of Spring Native is packaging uh, your Spring Boot applications as native executables using RAL VM. So instead of running our applications on the Java Virtual Machine, we run it natively on the machine. Some of the benefits of Spring Native are the following. First of all, instant startup time. And this is what we really need in order to use our Spring Boot applications in a serverless context. Then we also get instant peak performance and reduced memory consumption. And this is great because one of the goal of uh, choosing the serverless model is optimizing cost. So uh, we can already optimize cost by having the scaling to zero uh, opportunity, but we can also further optimize cost by having an application that consumes less memory than a more traditional uh, JVM-based application. Of course, Nothing comes for free, so we have some trade-offs uh, in this uh, approach. The first one is that the build process will be slower and heavier, because now we, at build time, we do a, a compilation to a native executable in a static way, so the result will be a static executable. We won't have all those optimizations that the Java Virtual Machine usually does at runtime. That's also an, another trade-off, fewer runtime optimizations. So instead of taking a few seconds to build your applications, it, it may take uh, a few minutes. So just something to consider. Let's have a look now at an example of Spring Boot application and how we can integrate Spring Native in order to build a native executable. I can create a new Spring Boot project from start.spring.io. In here, I will select Gradle as the build tool for the new project I want to build, Java, Spring Boot 2.5, the application will be called Web Service. Then I want to use the JAR packaging. That's what we use for cloud native applications. We don't use the, the word file anymore. Java 11. And then for the dependencies, since I want to create a simple web application, I need something to expose an HTTP endpoint and return a message. I have two choices. Either using the Spring MVC stack, which is an imperative stack based on the servlet API, and uh, Tomcat, or I can use uh, Reactive Web based on Project Reactor, which implements the Reactive Streams specification, and Nedi as the embedded web server. I prefer using Reactive Web for cloud native applications because uh, the Reactive model provides better resilience and scalability for my applications. Also, since uh, it's not uh, blocking threads when uh, uh, it's waiting for input output operations, 
it consumes uh, uh, in a more efficient way resources. So overall, I will also get cost optimization by using this stack. Finally, the memory footprint of a reactive application is much smaller than an imperative one. So for all those reasons, the reactive stack is my go-to choice for cloud native applications. So unless I have uh, very good reasons for not choosing this, uh, that's my default choice. Then we're talking about Spring Native, so I will have to include also the Spring Native dependency. You can see that it's uh, uh, marked as experimental. It's not released uh, as a GA yet. It will be soon. It provides already support for most of the Spring libraries, so feel free to uh, try it out and use it in your uh, application and see how it interacts with the rest uh, of your libraries. At this point, I can generate the project and open it in my IDE. So I have opened the project in IntelliJ. You can see there is only one Java class uh, with the main method initializing the Spring Boot application. And in here, let me uh, add a REST controller. The business logic for this application will be very easy. Let's create a grading controller. In particular, I want to handle get request to the root endpoint and return a message. Mono of string, I'm using Spring uh, Reactive, so I have to use one of the reactive types. Mono means at most one value. The other one is flux, which is for multiple values. So let me say get greetings, and then I can build a mono of string in this way, mono just, and then a message. Welcome to Barcelona. Perfect. So this is a very simple standard uh, Spring Boot web application. But since we added uh, Spring Native as a dependency to the project, we also get a few extra things uh, in our uh, build configuration. And it would be uh, the same for Gradle and for Maven. Let's have a look. First, we get a plugin called uh, Ahead of Time Compilation Plugin. It's the one responsible for compiling the uh, Spring Boot application as a native executable. So that, that's, that's the Spring native part. On top of that, we also get extra configuration whenever we add Spring native to the project for the boot build image task. This is the task that we use to containerize a Spring Boot application using the packet of build box implementation. When we have Spring native uh, as a dependency, we want to generate a native image. So by using this environment variable, which gets automatically set when you add Spring Native to the project, we can uh, uh, obtain a native image that we can deploy on uh, serverless platforms, like for example, uh, Knative. Since the build process uh, takes several minutes, I have already uh, containerized this application. Actually, I have containerized it uh, in two ways, as a JVM image and as a native image. So, let me show you. Locally, I have these two images. The first one is the JVM version and the native version. You can already see the differences between the two in terms of disk space because the native image is much smaller than the JVM image. I have deployed both applications on OpenShift so we can see how they differ in their execution. First thing first, the startup time. If we look at the logs for, from the JVM application, we can see that it started in 6.4 seconds, which is perfectly fine, uh, for example, in Kubernetes. But if we talk about serverless architectures, it's too much. Then looking at the native application, we can see that it started up in 0 0.09 seconds, which is awesome. It's what we were looking for in a serverless applications. On top of that, we also get uh, optimizations in terms of memory usage. So let me look at the metrics here. So we are looking at the memory usage uh, for both applications. And we can see that the baseline, so there's no request coming in. The baseline for the JVM application is uh, 133 megabytes against the 42 megabytes consumed by the native application. To sum up, with Spring Native, we can achieve instant startup time instant peak performance and reduced memory consumption. But of course, be aware of the trade-offs, in particular, slower and heavier uh, build process and fewer runtime optimizations. So far, we have talked about standard web applications. 
But in the serverless uh, model, a lot of uh, requirements uh, can be uh, expressed in a more natural way using functions. The functional programming paradigm is uh, commonly used for serverless applications because of the event-driven nature of such ar architectures. We have seen that uh, uh, with an HTTP request, we can trigger uh, an application on a serverless platform. If we think uh, in terms of supplier, processor, and consumer, it becomes even more natural to implement uh, business logic in this type of applications. In Java, we have some interfaces that have been introduced in Java 8 that we can use to uh, express business logic in terms of this paradigm. We have the supplier interface, the function interface, and the consumer interface. So this will be the foundation for our uh, functional implementation of business logic. But we need something more than that. And that's why we introduce Spring Cloud Function. Spring Cloud Function uh, is a project that encourages implementing business logic in terms of functions, leveraging the standard Java interfaces. Let's have a look at some of the main features. First of all, it provides transparent type conversion. If you work with uh, standard Java functions, uh, you can only combine them if the output type of the first function is the same as the input type of the second function. And that is kind of limiting. So with Spring Cloud Function, we get type conversion transparently provided by the framework. Then we can compose functions in a declarative way. So through some configuration properties, we can uh, uh, declare the whole uh, data pipeline without having to write any code to do that. Then we have uh, the possibility of defining multiple inputs and multiple outputs. This is a feature that is particularly uh, uh, used in a reactive context because in Spring Reactive, which is based on Project Reactor, we have the concept of tuples. So using tuples, we can specify multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Since Spring Cloud Function is based on uh, really standard Java functions, we can import uh, JAR artifacts containing standard Java functions and use them uh, to build a, a greater data pipeline. So we can import JAR functions into our application. And there are also some uh, uh, functions available uh, in the Spring Cloud project that you can use to compose and implement your business logic. And finally, uh, Spring Cloud function provides support for reactive not only by itself, but you can uh, use in the same application both imperative and reactive functions, compose them together, and the transparent app conversion feature will take care of handling uh, how to move data from an imperative function to a reactive one. Let's have a look at an example. The starting point is always the Spring Initializer, so I'll create a new Gradle project using Spring Boot 2.5, this time we're going to build an application called Web Function using the JAR packaging and Java 11 as dependencies. Once again, I'm going to add Spring Native because I want to uh, make it uh, a serverless ready application. Then I'm going to add Spring Reactive Web because the trigger for the functions will be a HTTP request. And finally, I add the dependency on Spring Cloud Function. So now I can generate the project and open it in my IDE. For this example, we're going to implement the following requirement. Given the name of a musical instrument as input, like piano, we want to get back a sentence like, I can play the piano, where the name of the musical instrument is converted to uppercase. We can implement this requirement using functional interfaces, the same interfaces provided by standard Java. So let's start with the first function which accepts uh, a string as input and will provide a string as output. This one will be responsible for converting the name of the musical instrument into uppercase. So it will accept the name of the musical instrument and it will return that same string, but to uppercase. Then to better follow the flow through the log messages, I will also add a print statement converting to uppercase, like that. The next part of the requirement is building the, uh, the sentence, I can play the piano. So I will uh, write another function. This time I want to make it reactive. I will uh, use mono of string as the input type and mono of string as the output type. 
let's call it sentence. So in this case, the input will be a mono, and then we'll map the name of the, the capitalized and convert it to uppercase musical instrument. We'll map it to a full sentence saying, I can play the, and then the name of the instrument. And once again, I'll add the print statement so we can follow the flow. Building skill sentence like that. Now that I have these two functions, I have to combine them somehow. But using standard Java uh, uh, functions, I cannot do that because the output type of the first function is different than the input type of the second function. Also, in order to compose them, I would have to uh, programmatically write some code in order to yeah, to realize this composition. And finally, if I want to also uh, be able to trigger this function uh, from an HTTP request, I would have to write some uh, functionality to listen to HTTP request and trigger the function. But since we have Spring Cloud function in the project, I can just let the framework deal with all that uh, plumbing and infrastructural concerns. I just need to annotate the functions as beans, so the framework knows that it should handle these functions and enhance them with uh, extra features. So that's the only framework-related code that you'll see in these functions, because everything else is just uh, standard Java. In the configuration properties file, I can define how to uh, compose the functions together. In particular, I will use the property called Spring Cloud Function Definition, and then I write uppercase pipe sentence. So now uh, the framework knows about the functions because I mark them as beans, knows about how I want to uh, use them to build a data pipeline, in this case, uppercase and then sentence. And also, since uh, uh, I have the Spring Reactive Web dependency in my project, Spring Cloud Function will automatically expose this cloud function through an HTTP endpoint. So to recap, Spring Cloud Function is uh, making it possible to compose these two functions even if they don't have compatible types, because it will uh, uh, transparently convert uh, the output type and the input type of the two functions, which is really great. Also, it lets me combine uh, imperative and reactive functions in the same applications. And finally, since I have Spring Reactive Web in the project, it will also make it possible to trigger this uh, data pipeline through an HTTP request. So now I will run the application, and from uh, a terminal window, for example, using curl, I can send a POST request. The content type will be text plain because I'm just sending the name of a musical instrument. The application is running on localhost 8080. Since there is only one cloud function, that will be exposed through the root endpoint automatically. And then I need to specify the name of an instrument. And there it is. I get back the final sentence. I can play the piano. We have seen some of the main features provided by Spring Cloud Functions. So the next question is, how can we deploy these types of applications? One way is to package the application and uh, deploy it on uh, one of the function as a service platforms provided by Azure, AWS, or Google Cloud. The project itself provides some adapters that you can uh, include in your project in order to uh, build and compile your application so that it can be deployed on one of these platforms. Or another way is uh, following the same process that we used in the previous example and containerize the application using build packs and deploy it on a platform like Knative that you can run on your Kubernetes cluster, or you can use a managed service like Red Hat OpenShift or a Google Cloud Run. Also, we have seen examples uh, regarding HTTP request, but Spring Cloud Function supports more than that. For example, it supports uh, the cloud event specification to define events uh, in a cloud environment. So as long as you uh, send a request using the format defined by cloud events, then the framework will handle that according to the specification. You can even uh, uh, use other protocols 
for example, our socket, which is a reactive binary protocol. So far, we have considered HTTP requests, but there are other types of events. Serverless applications are really event-driven, and a lot of these events usually come from an event broker like RabbitMQ or Kafka. In Spring, we can use the Spring Cloud Stream project, which is based on Spring Cloud function, so everything that we, uh, we have seen so far is still valid, but on top of that, it will uh, provide us with uh, a binding of our functions with external event brokers like RabbitMQ or Kafka. And this is a really powerful uh, framework because without changing anything in your code, you get your functions automatically bound to external communication channels. No change is required. Let's have a look at an example. One more time, we initialize a new Spring Boot project from start.spring.io. I'll choose Gradle Java Spring Boot 2.5. The application will be called Stream Function. This time I'm gonna use Java 16 because I want to use the new records feature. And as for the dependencies, I will add Spring Cloud Stream, RabbitMQ, and then I will not add Spring Native because uh, at the moment it's not supported yet. So Spring Cloud Stream is one of the few libraries uh, which are not uh, fully supported yet, but support will be added soon. If I try to add this, uh, the initializer application will uh, add a note in the help file. So if I expand the project and check the help file here, I can find a note saying that uh, CloudStream and RabbitMQ are not uh, fully supported right now from Spring Native. So you get a warning should you uh, try to add a dependency which is not supported yet. But support will be added soon. So I will uh, remove Spring Native and I will open the project in IntelliJ. For this application, I want to uh, reuse the same functions that we implemented in the previous example. So let me copy them from the web function application. I will paste them in this new stream function application, but this time I want to uh, do something slightly different to show you yet another uh, feature offered by Spring Cloud Function. Instead of uh, uh, dealing with uh, string types, I want to define two record types. So I'll define a record called instrument with only one field of type string named name, and then a record called scale with one field called message. And now instead of using string, I can use these record types. Under the hood, Spring Cloud function uh, will transparently convert types between functions. So the first one will get an instrument as input and an instrument as output. And the second one will get a string as a mono of string as input still, but as output, I want a mono of scale. Then I have to update the return types. So in here, I will return a new instrument like this. And then for the second function, I want to return a new skill record. Perfect, so it's the, uh, it's the same functions that we used uh, in the previous example, but this time I'm using records. It's just to showcase how uh, powerful the transparent app conversion feature is. Then, once again, in the application properties file, I have to define which is the data pipeline that I want the framework to handle. So I will uh, use the same property, Spring Cloud Function Definition, like that. So it's still uppercase pipe sentence. And this would be enough. Since I have RabbitMQ in the class path and I have a RabbitMQ instance running locally, the function would be uh, automatically bound uh, to the message queue. But I want to further customize how the exchanges and queues in RabbitMQ are named. And I can do it from here. So I will use the Spring Cloud stream bindings properties like that. And the input binding, so the binding associated to the input of this cloud function, by uh, convention, the logical name is uppercase sentence, 
which is just using the names of the two functions, then dash in, as in input, and then zero. Zero is the partition number, which in RabbitMQ is not something that we use, but if you're working with Kafka, then you would have uh, the possibility to handle different partitions here. But in RabbitMQ, uh, it will always be zero. So this is the logical name identifying the input binding. And then the output binding, it will be named in a very similar way, uppercase sentence, out, because it's the output, and then zero. For each of them, I can define how to name the destination in RabbitMQ, which will be uh, converted into a RabbitMQ exchange of type topic. So this one is the source of the instrument name, so I'll call it instrument. And for the output, I'll call it uh, skill. Then uh, one more thing for the uh, input channel, since uh, uh, basically I this function is a consumer of that channel, I also want to define a consumer group name so that if I have multiple uh, application instances running, only one of them will uh, read the event and handle it. So I will uh, call the group stream function. Now I can start the application. The first thing I notice after starting up the application is that uh, Spring Cloud Stream created two new exchanges in RabbitMQ, instrument and skill. They are of type topic. Also, since in the application we have one consumer, it also created a queue called instrument stream function. There's no queue associated to the skill exchange because there's no consumer in the application reading from that queue. At this point, we can test if uh, our application is working. So by going into the instrument exchange, I'll send a message with an instrument name. I will use a JSON type, a field called name, value, guitar. I publish the message. And then by looking at the logs uh, of the application, we can see if the message has been read and processed. If we look at the application logs, we can see that uh, the message has been processed correctly. We can see the, the print statement from the first function converting to uppercase, and then the second function building skill sentence. In this presentation, we focused on serverless applications, but Spring Cloud Stream can uh, be used in general to build event-driven microservices. You get integration with uh, uh, several event brokers. Some of them, like RabbitMQ and Kafka, are uh, already provided by the project itself. Some others are provided by uh, partners. So you will find bindings uh, for your functions to connect to the message services uh, provided by Azure, by AWS by Google. You can establish this publish, publish subscribe uh, communication model. You can use consumer groups in order to ensure that uh, if you have, for example, an application replicated in your environment, only one application in that group uh, consumes the message. And then you get support for partitions. Of course, if you're using Kafka, you get that natively, but Spring Cloud Stream also provides an abstractions on top of that so that you can even use partitions on top of RabbitMQ. We have worked with a simple example, and uh, we mainly relied on the default configuration. But of course, you have the possibility to configure any aspect of the binding, both in general, but also leveraging the functionality provided by the specific event broker you're using. So for example, if you're using Kafka, then you will have access to extra configuration for the partitioning. If you're using RabbitMQ, Maybe in a context of event-driven microservices where you use the saga pattern to establish transactions between microservices, uh, then you might want to uh, configure the binding with RabbitMQ so that the queue is transactional and ensure that if you uh, at the same time write some state in a data store and send an event through the queue to inform the other microservices that these two operations are uh, executed in a transactional context. Either they both succeed or they both are rolled back. Otherwise, we enter an inconsistent state. In conclusion, we have seen how to build event-driven and serverless applications with Spring Boot. We started with Spring Native, which lets us build application with instant startup time and reduce memory consumption. Next, we looked at Spring Cloud function, 
which lets us implement uh, the business logic of our applications as functions, and then provides extra features in order to compose those functions into a data pipeline, transparently convert types, and expose those functions as HTTP endpoints. Finally, we looked at Spring Cloud Stream, which, building on top of Spring Cloud Function, lets you uh, bind your functions to external event brokers like RabbitMQ and Kafka. All of that without changing anything in your code. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn if you'd like to chat about Spring or, or Kubernetes. I'll be happy to do that. Have a great day and see you next time.